I'm getting ready to go. Awesome. Well, since everyone was so prompt, <laughs> I feel like we can probably get started uh, now if you're ready. Yeah, sure thing. I, I admire everybody's punctuality. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's really awesome. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I welcome you all uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Lauren and I am the owner and co-founder of Focus on Health. Um, for the month of February, we are really um, just leaning into these stories that are often untold uh, and left out when discussing innovations and contributions uh, from the African American community. So today, uh, for our Speed Rock Academy session, we have Miss Ella Louise uh, from New Orleans discussing the Treme, and I'm very excited to, to hear about all the research that she was able to do. Um, but I would really love if you could just start off simply by introducing yourself and then we can get into it. Absolutely. Um, hey, my name is Ella Louise. Um, I've been a native of New Orleans for the past seven years. Um, I am currently a um, personal experience curator. I do uh, pop-ups, Filipino food, and then I pair uh, cocktails with it. So um, other than that, this is going to be a really great thing for everybody, even for myself, um, especially being a transplant to New Orleans. And I'm just very excited to talk about the most favorite part of the city that I love. Awesome. All right. I'm going to let you take it away, girl. You got uh, sweet. OK, the Treme, African-American history in New Orleans. Um, with our lovely sponsors, uh, Speed Rack and Focus on Health. And then I have Eames and Tori that came in clutch with the product today um, that we'll be featuring throughout our cocktails. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, this is just to give you a brief timeline um, because for myself, going into research, it's like a weird chaos. So I had to make a timeline and um, I'll do my best to stick to it, but we're basically gonna go through a general introduction of it and really talk about how Treme even started um, along with the monumentous uh, points and the creation of Treme and how very important they are to the everyday life of any Nor New Orleanian or anybody that just comes to visit or anybody that plans to live here. So we'll start off with um, Welcome to Treme. Um, so the Treme was founded in 1783. Uh, the swamp and marshes surrounding New Orleans during the 1700s came to as what we know now today as the Treme. Um, it's also known as Back of Town uh, or in its formal French name, Fargo Treme. Uh, Farbourg is basically um, a French uh, term for suburb. Uh, it was decided that the swampy land be carved into suburban plots for profit in the 1790s. The neighborhood has a rich Creole and African-American history as one of the oldest such districts in the country, actually. Um, like most downtown inner cities, New Orleans neighborhoods during the late 1800s through the early 1900s, uh, it was integrated with French Creoles, not by white Americans. So this was basically with that being said, this was like a, a dreamland for uh, free slaves. And we'll, we'll touch later on that also. Um, present day Treme is still integrated and its residents are still mostly Creole and African-American. Residents of the Treme are native New Orleans, transplants like myself, um, working professionals, artists, musicians, and community leaders, entrepreneurs, and as well as activists. Uh, there is much pride associated with having a Treme address. It is a home of some of the coolest landmarks, some of my favorite landmarks, that including Louis Armstrong Park, historic graveyards that actually have Madame DeVoe, the Voodoo Queen, uh, Congo Square, St. Augustine, the Lafitte Housing Project, Little Disease, Dookie Chase, and et cetera. Um, so in this slide, I, I wanted to show 
basically what I said earlier, how the Treme and all the other surrounding communities that came on later were actually not really planned. Um, the land that you see in the left uh, photo there is actually New Orleans as itself. And that land was actually sought out by the Native Americans. Uh, they gave basically the plug like, hey, it's above um, marshes. You don't have to worry about flooding or hurricane or anything like that. But everything surrounding was literally mud. And um, once the Treme was actually bought and purchased and thought about, um, slaves actually dug up these marshes with their hands. Um, and what's crazy is that everything surrounding, they did that by their hands. And we're looking now to the right, this is actually the boundaries of Treme. This is just one of the many outskirts that make up New Orleans as a whole. Um, this one might be a little outdated, but so Treme basically starts where you see Rampart, it'll go all the way up to Broad um, and it'll come back down. It's much larger. The darker, thank you, <laughs> the uh, darker brown area is what they call the historic part of Treme and we'll touch on that later as well. Um, so, the upbringing of it, um, it was founded by Claude Treme. Uh, Claude Treme was a um, French resident that came in. He was a hat maker and also a real estate uh, developer. He actually married a freed slave, uh, Julie Moreau, and uh, they actually came in possession of the Treme plantation, which is, if you've ever been, uh, where you can find Louis Armstrong Park. It is the largest plantation uh, noted on New Orleans land. Um, Julie Moreau and Claude Treme were wed in 1793. Uh, prior to that, the plantation had been passed down after the death of her paternal grandmother. So Julie Moreau was um, a slave and how she actually got possession of the plantation was out of sheer luck. Um, the family was of Creole descent but they had gone through so many names that even right now it's arguable that her name is not even Moreau. Um, but other than that, she is responsible for obtaining this uh, plot of land. The plantation was developed in 1725 by Chevalier Chagallin Moran. Um, in 1775, Julie and Claude came into possession of the Treme plantation. Although having possession of the plantation, their plans were to create subdivisions on grounds for, and we're going to use FPC through this uh, for people, free people of color, um, to occupy. Their remaining lots were then sold to the city of New Orleans in 1810, allowing Fourgore Chame to be incorporated, uh, incorporated later in 1812. And um, this lot especially is they still have. Um, those same subdivisions. Uh, what they did do, although uh, Claude Treme was French, he was also still very racist. Um, he was very threatened by a lot of the still enslaved um, occupancies to this plantation, where, you know, brutality was what it was, unfortunately. But in the light of it, he did give and house free people of color as well as even the slaves, better housing than what they would have had had the French just came and occupied. Um, next slide. Sweet. Free the people. Um, so when I say free the people, and again, this is a lot of new research for me. Um, I, I've had a very brief touch on how New Orleans is very free going. Um, especially with the Spanish culture and influence. Um, if anything, it's not any better than slavery, but this was basically uh, a place where free people of color can obtain land. They can have businesses, um, especially if they're free. They can live like free people. And uh, if anything, even at that time, it was, it was a pure luxury. And this is before the Anglo-Saxons came in and kind of did their stuff. But um, during the 1700s, slavery in New Orleans was distinctly different from other places, like I mentioned, um, in the United States because of French and Spanish influence. African slaves here had the legal right to earn money 
by their freedom if they so desired. Uh, soon after the subdivisions were placed, Treme quickly became a racially mixed community. Many of the neighborhood's first homeowners were mostly black women, actually, which is awesome. Um, free people of color, including Haitian immigrants who fled from the Haitian Revolution via 1791 to 1804. Uh, by November 14th, 1841, Blacks owned 80% of the land in Tremaine. As a result, New Orleans quickly became home to the largest free Black community in the Deep South and the oldest Black neighborhood in New Orleans today, or I'm sorry, in the United States to date. This is awesome. Oh, this is my favorite part. So this is why I fell so in love with, <laughs> this is why I fell so in love uh, with New Orleans. Um, I'm definitely like an architectural geek, like uh, backstory. I raised in military. So like all the housing I've seen is very, you know, stucco uniform until I came, I mean, other than Chicago, but this is different. Um, when I came to New Orleans, uh, I just fell in love. And one of my first tours was actually um, a tour of a Victorian, French Victorian house. I've never seen this sort of architecture in my life. And ever since then, I can look in detail and uh, see how very unique and how influential not only African American, uh, I'm sorry, African culture next to uh, Spanish culture, French culture. Again, this is a melting pot. You got Haitian people too. Um, the house on the left, we're gonna start with the Creole Cottage, was one of my first houses whoop, whoop, in the Treme. So Treme was my very first place that I lived when I moved here. Um, so what makes a Creole Cottage? Um, it has very unique and distinct um, characteristics too. So uh, the Creole Cottage was, will always be a double-sided unit. So there will be two different doors. Um, I know the colors are amazing, right? Girl, you should see them. It's like a freaking rainbow everywhere. Um, so what makes them very distinct from all the other houses I'm going to mention later, uh, you see the very front part of the roofing. All Creole cottage houses have a very flat roofing. It's, they're normally one single, like single stories. Um, if they do have a half story, it's only to let light inside of the house. Um, normally, like if they had bedrooms up there, It'd be very shallow and for my research they used to like these they used to crowd these houses i know back then space was nothing to them they'll sacrifice space as long as everyone has a place to stay um these houses are very unique and still the oldest um forms of architecture here uh i know all the bartenders in the room you've been to John Lafitte's blacksmith shop. That is actually one of the oldest um, forms of a Creole cottage. And you know, like how it's like very low, very dense. Um, there's a lot of windows, uh, the shutters and the, how can I say this, floor to ceiling doors um, definitely comes from the French influence. And these houses were, of course, for the poor. So they didn't actually have a lawn. So whenever you see them, they'll come immediately to the sidewalk. They didn't have the luxury of having a fence or anything like that. Um, moving on to the double gallery townhouses, these occupied a lot of space um, in, within the Treme. And these houses you can find along Esplanade Avenue, which was um, associated as like basically like uh, how can I say it's like the up it's like the uptown version or St. Charles version of the train. Um, these townhouses would always be double story and for the most part they'll always have like a back part to the roof I'm sorry back part to the unit and they have the luxury of actually having a iron fence well they're always be met the pillars are very substantial too it's a very distinct um, representation of wealth and what's crazy is most women occupied these double stories. And why they did was because at the bottom, they'd run a shop of any kind, a mom and pop shop, um, a apothecary. And then at the very top, I know, that's, that's why I love this stuff. 
um, at the top, they'll make it all pretty with like the, uh, the lacings of the iron fences and everything like that. So they'll live upstairs while they run a business downstairs. Um, and these are actually, what's crazy is these are a lot of, they make up a lot of empty lots right now currently because these houses for some reason were, again, a, a label of your presence, how much money you actually had even being a free slave. And like I said, again, it was occupied by women most of the time. Um, moving to the shotgun. This is, <laughs> so this is pretty much like the stigma of when you come to New Orleans and you visit your friend, most likely you're staying in a shotgun place. Uh, the term shotgun uh, is very wide actually. It goes down to Mississippi, to Kentucky, and it's just li like literally the styling of the house. It's not even an architectural style. Um, the term shotgun comes from the way that it's laid out. So when you walk in, you have a living room, a bedroom, a kitchen, and maybe a bathroom in between. But how they came up with the term is like, if somebody comes to the front door, shoots a shotgun, it'll literally go from the front to the back, hence shotgun. Um, these houses were actually a part of um, Claude Trenet's initial, I know, right? <laughs> um, initial subdivision project, like where he will give people housing, um, hence like the feet project. And these were very affordable, especially a lot of people working on the river, um, anybody working in the mills. This at one point was considered like um, livable. Nobody judged you at all. Um, come the 1920s, it later became a sign of poverty. Like you're not even middle class, you're like below class. But what's crazy is that these units are so historical that you can find them even in Chicago. Um, like I said, Kentucky and Mississippi. These were definitely used for uh, war people that were serving in the war. Again, people of the working class um, and how I mentioned earlier that nobody cared about space. It was all sacrificial to them. Uh, and the way that all of these houses were built, again, the architecture stems from African and Haitian roots. Living in New Orleans or right by the Mississippi River, all of these were made so that like, it can be, how do you say it? You don't experience hurricanes. All the shutters will entrap you from any debris flying away. Uh, they were all raised as well so that they did not sit. Wait, old what? I, I thought I read old shopping bags for a second. <laughs> um, they were raised and so that of course they didn't, they didn't sit on the marshlands. And um, if you open up your windows, you notice all they have very large windows. It was so that they can let air flow. And you'll find a lot of that, like just plan in a lot of plantations as well here. And you can uh, thank the Haitians for the premeditated air conditioning. Wait, can I do this every time we move to the slide? Oh, sweet. Oh, okay. With that being said, it's cocktail time. Um, so the Boulevardier actually touches home for me. Um, like I said, I'm not originally from New Orleans, but uh, luckily being in the hospitality industry, um, people took care of me. And my very first cocktail after being a noob was a Boulevardier. Um, I have this, wait, I have to get up before I start getting my glass. My assistant is like asleep, so. Don't worry, I got you. Yeah, I was like, my husband's asleep. So I'm just gonna go. One second, y'all. Grab your well, this, this is really great. The uh, I love that you incorporated the architectural like um, tie-in to New Orleans because, like you said, with Chicago, I feel like whenever I visit New Orleans, I'm always so it like so uh, invested in how beautiful the buildings are. Can I share a fun fact? I'm always yeah, really of weird. course. <laughs> look at housing structures like oh that's zombie proof like you know zombie apocalypse totally can do it come to new orleans when you close those shutters dude and you lock them down 
pure gold. It's just like everything's so very unique and I love that. Um, and the, the colors that we mentioned earlier, uh, I love how people go to town with, you can't see that anywhere else, you know? Like if I were to see that in New Mexico, I'd be mad actually. It's like, what are you doing? It's, a, it's like literally a New Orleans thing and I'm, I'm absolutely enthralled by it. All right. Um, so Boulevard A, very first cocktail uh, in New Orleans, and I'm definitely a Negroni fan, but when somebody tells me to trust them, I'm going to trust them. And uh, a bartender at actually um, what we call St. Bernard, which is in the Treme, where you'll find a lot of the historic Black bars, um, a few of them still open, of course. Uh, I was taken by a friend of mine that uh, used to own Sydney Saloon. Um, Sydney Saloon, which is now owned by those that own The Saint. I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with The Saint or Santos. Uh, he brought me there. He's like, you got to try this cocktail. I'm like, hey, say no more. So we're going to do the Boulevardier. It's still one of my favorite sippers, absolutely. Uh, the Boulevardier is loosely translated um, as a man about town. I was a lady about town then. Um, a cocktail by the same name was created by Erskine Gwynn. Forgive me if I butchered that. Uh, the publisher of Boulevardier, it was a magazine for expats living in Paris during the 1920s. <laughs> er, skin Nguyen, an American-born writer uh, who founded the monthly magazine in Paris called the Boulevardier, which appeared from 1927 to 1932. Um, again, it's one of my favorite cocktails. I prefer it up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it as if I would in a bar. I definitely prefer a chilled glass, which we have here. Um, and it's also a stirred cocktail. Got my napkin so I don't mess myself up here. Um, we're going to use this evening Nod Creek from our lovely supporters at BMC Tori. Uh, again, for this recipe, I'm gonna do it just like I would in a bar, as you would in a Negroni as well. Um, I do two parts of uh, rye whiskey or whiskey in general. Use that cap. Yes. All right. Um, Campari, our lovely friend. Um, what I've what I've come to know is like really when it comes to a Boulevardier, you have the equal parts um, tomorrow to the, the vermouth, but it really does depend on your base liquor. And with Knob Creek, I really love how Knob Creek spices complement a Spanish vermouth. Um, and I do equal parts, Campari to sweet vermouth. I've never made a cocktail actually sitting down, so this is cool. I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to be like, man, you're going to be so good at this by the end of like the quarantine days. <laughs> like I'm going to show up to work in a chair, like I'm ready to work. All right, and a Spanish vermouth. Um, Lestal is a very great one. I love the nuttiness. Again, it adds to a spice that you'll find in uh, Knob Creek. Um, if you really like a nice rye as well, um, there are a few, but again, it's very, it's very um, personal. And that is something that I like to ask anybody if they, like, I like to ask, like, hey, what's your preference on your bourbon or your rye whiskey? And you can go from there. So we did uh, two parts of the Knob Creek, huzzah. Uh, we did equal parts Campari to a Spanish red vermouth. Make sure you get every little drop there. And it said mixing glass. Add ice to it. And I know the term normally is, what is it? Sorry, I cursed. Uh, you know what? We're going to spin it for about 15 seconds. Um, dilution is definitely a thing. For me, it's more like an eyesight sort of thing. Um, I can, I tell, I judge by the water line. Mess in my own house. Okay. After that, strain it into your chilled glass here. And again, you can actually have this up or on the rocks. 
I mean, I don't even drink water with ice, so I usually prefer it. But anyhow, um, after that, uh, we, preference again, you can do right. <laughs> um, your preference, you can do a lemon. I preferably like the lemon. Um, again, it's weird aesthetic, and also it complements all the flavors ingredients in the cocktail. Express, little wipe, twist. Huzzah. Uh, Boulevardier. Cheers. Beautiful. Nice. And this is great because you can throw that in your fridge and drink it at the end of your class. <laughs> well, yeah, when my assistant wakes up, he can wake up to a Boulevardier. Wait. All right. Still doing stuff right. That's great. Any questions on that at all? <laughs> um, about the Boulevardier? What I've, what I've come to know, like bartending in New Orleans, that's pretty much what everybody wants in a Negroni. You can get that anywhere, but most people will definitely go for the Boulevardier. It's uh, definitely more of a New Orleans kind of themed cocktail. All right. That was actually really good. Okay. Um, so we know uh, New Orleans to be a, an epicenter for uh, culture, music, food, um, literature, history. Uh, but most people can argue or want to argue that it is not the birthplace of jazz, but it is. And there's so many reasons why. Um, all that jazz. Also, if you ever live here, NPR has the best, who that? NPR has the best station here in New Orleans. Best jazz you'll ever listen to, actually. Um, so from Esplanade to St. Louis, Broad to North Rampart, which were the borders we mentioned earlier, uh, Treme is considered ground zero for culture and activism in America. Uh, New Orleans became the breeding ground for uniquely American art from Ellis Marshall's, I don't have my glasses on, Marsalis, sorry, Kermit Ruffins, uh, Irvin Mayfield, to Troy Trombone Shorty, which is an awesome dude, um, Andrews, Rebirth, Brass Bands, and so much more. I know, you gotta come here sometimes, it's a little weird, but jazz is definitely from here. Trust me, person with the song, but trust me. Um, those are just a few of the living legends who keep jazz going through and in this place for all to begin with in New Orleans. Um, jazz is a byproduct of the unique cultural environment found in New Orleans at the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, with the vestiges of French and Spanish colonial roots, the resilience of African influences after slavery era, and the influx of immigrants from Europe. Um, Congo Square, which is one of my favorite places, um, is located, what's crazy, it's like all one thing. You got the plantation, you have uh, Mahala, uh, Mahala Theater, Mahala Jackson Theater, you have Congo Square, and you have Louis Armstrong Park, all in one block which is phenomenal, like, <laughs> um, Congo Square was a place where black slaves uh, could once again be Africans, um, even if for just like an afternoon. And once a week, it was always held on Sundays. Uh, they would bring drums, bells, and other musical instruments to the square and gather and roughly uh, by tribe to play music, sing, and dance. Um, and what's crazy, this really does tie into the culture of Treme currently. Every Sunday, they don't congregate at Congo Square, but they will definitely occupy all of Treme to ride their motorcycles, play music, barbecue pits everywhere, kids playing their music, like it's amazing. So they kind of do still keep that tradition, but nobody wants to get arrested in the park, unfortunately. So they do it on a public street. Um, although the argument currently is that jazz and musical groups that are associated with New Orleans as a whole has died, uh, locals do everything they can to preserve the authenticity and tradition. So we have second lines, we have jazz funerals, uh, the Treme Brass Band, which is a historical brass band, um, and institutions established by, who I mentioned earlier, Trombone Shorty, and Tipitina's, which is a historical music venue out here, they have actually uh, implemented institutions to uh, allow kids, 
despite the lack of funds in that education, in that, um, I'm sorry, realm of education to play instruments. So they'll keep, like they'll, I, and this is one of my favorite parts of also living in Treme. There's a part of the season when all the kids will start practicing for the parades and everything like that. And it brings me to tears to know that they are so passionate to keep it like, like this is, this is what it is. Like it's, it's music. It's waking up in the morning to people playing music down, the, down your street. Um, so they're, they are doing their best to preserve that um, element of the culture uh, in, in Treme. And one of those pictures, that's the Congo Square. Congo Square also, not only was it like, you know, um, inhabited by African slaves, there were still the French and the Creole uh, descendants. And what's crazy is like, they didn't even care to um, be mad about it. They actually joined in. So it was definitely like a congregational sort of thing. Um, it was overseed by uh, Bob Forgies. He overseed 500 people every single time. And he was actually a uh, French colonialist sorry, white, um, but he didn't complain about it either because he was always met by um, African music with French songs, which is great. I'm sorry, his name was Benjamin Latrobe. I'm getting all these names wrong. I'm getting started. Uh, Congo, Congo, oh, okay, can we coin that? That'd be dope. I'm gonna write a poster about it now. All right, and that's music. Uh, from Treme. Um, this is also my favorite part. So I mentioned that like, no longer do they congregate a, con a, a Congo Square. Um, they now do their super Sundays or just Sundays, which I've, I've had to like have somebody kind of correct me. Like, why is everybody out on a Sunday? I got work on Monday. It's because it's the day that everybody gets the party and it's, always in the Treme. You don't find it anywhere else in the city. They will occupy Claiborne. Um, Claiborne used to be actually, at first, a just like brick um, set aside land, but later became a lovely oak tree shaded part of Treme where families used to congregate, um, where they'd have their picnics and everything like that. Uh, Claiborne Avenue, as we see it now, was once a brickyard, like I mentioned, by the Company of Indies. I would have put it in French, but again, I'm not going to butcher it. Um, the Claiborne underpass before the construction of the I-10 served as a hub for Treme businesses or for the Treme business district and neutral ground where Black families would congregate and where Mardi Gras Indians, as you can see, those very elaborate and colorful, um, I'm not even going to call them costumes, just dressings of their culture um, is where you'll find them. And that's where they flourish. Uh, Super Sunday, which is the best, <laughs> better than Mardi Gras, um, is where they'd also celebrate it. Uh, with the development of the interstate, unfortunately, it dismantled many of the Black-owned businesses, as well as displaced many of the Treme residents. Um, in its boom, where it was basically like the Black uh, Wall Street, you know, um, they had their own business district. So in its boom, it served as a, the Canal Street for people of color. Uh, servicing its residents with necessary amenities like pharmacies, legal services, restaurants, theaters. The most iconic establishments among this district was called the Circle, as you can see in the top left there. Uh, that store has been through, God, a lot of things. And even to this day, I really love that they preserve the fact that it is um, a neighborhood store. Um, it was a black owned grocer that not only supplied food to the neighborhood, but also provided avenues for people to seek healthcare, um, check cashing, and you can also purchase your kids' school clothes there. So it was, it was basically the Walmart for them at the time. I hate to downplay it like that, but I can find everything at Walmart, right? Um, and to this day, they still do carry on with the, the, the despite COVID and everything, they carry on with Mardi Gras Indians. Again, that store is actually up and running again as well. The, the businesses along it are actually thriving too. Uh, there's definitely a lot more neighborhood support now that people are understanding that that was basically where 
people of color can go. Um, but yeah, uh, and what's crazy is the fact that when you go there, it's nothing but pillars, it's beautiful, don't get me wrong, pillars of nothing but art, but to look down Claiborne and just imagine uh, a community thriving under oak trees and people living freely and businesses thriving and the fellow man helping the fellow man. It's, it's kind of weird to see, but people are still, again, doing their best to preserve what they know the Treme as. Pistols. Huzzah. Um, upon looking uh, and researching the Treme, Again, this is all new information for me too. Um, the three, and I will mention another one that I didn't have room to put on this slide that is definitely an icon of mine. Um, we'll start with Tomo Lofondo. Uh, he was a philanthropist that funded schools that educated black children across New Orleans uh, while substantially helped fund the Underground Railroad. Oh, I forgot the D in there. Anti, hi baby, anti-slavery society. <laughs> Anti-slavery society, charity hospitals, and Sister of the Holy Family. Sisters of the Holy Family is still a very um, running institution now. They actually do help a lot of us uh, hospitality workers with our Medicaid needs and everything like that, which is great. So thank you, Tom and Lafon, for funding it. Um, next man, Charles Louis Rudinans, uh procured the first bilingual African-American daily newspaper called the New Orleans Tribune um, in 1864. The Tribune was published by McKenna Publishing Company, which also publishes the Black Book. And I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with like what the Green Book was. That was, the Black Book was pretty much what uh, that was to native New Orleanians. Um, a directory of African-American businesses and a welcome guide for black tourists to New Orleans. Next man, Gangster's Hill, Homer Plessy. Um, if you're all familiar with Plessy versus Ferguson, this guy's a gangster. Uh, Plessy was a racially mixed shoemaker uh, who agreed to take part in an act of a civil disobedience orchestrated by a New Orleans civil rights organization. Um, on that hot, sticky afternoon, he walked into a Press Street Depot, purchased my face is all in the way of this. Can I move? Sorry, guys. Again, I'm. I promised I wasn't gonna make it weird. Can I, oh, yeah, I don't wanna look at myself like this. Um, he purchased a first class ticket and took a seat on the whites only car. Um, so during that time, there was a uh, segregated seating act that had been uh, placed. And this guy, which I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with the, like you can pass as like, you know, a paper bag. Like if you're lighter than a paper bag, you're considered white. This guy was white, said white girl, and the conductor actually asked him if he was a colored man, and he said yes, and it just sparked this whole controversy, um, kind of make, making the lawmakers of Louisiana sound like hypocrites, and unfortunately, it was a major fail for uh, those, for the lawmakers of Louisiana, because they basically were hypocrites about their word. Um, so yeah, he unfortunately lost it, but he has been an advocate for all of any uh, civil rights, I'm sorry, African-American activist motions in the Treme. And the fourth person, and again, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to put her on here, um, is Marie Antoinette, um, Andriette, I'm sorry. Uh, Marie Andriette was also a Creole woman. Uh, in her family, she had the liberty to wed uh, any rich Frenchman, um, anybody other than color, and she actually chose not to. She devoted her life um, and basically her life to educating the slaves uh, that were held captive at all the cathedrals. And she was actually like uh, ostracized for this. Her family kind of wanted to can't hear the word. Basically say, oh, you're not part of the family anymore. Um, but she she dedicated her life to this and they now have a um, orphanage dedicated to her that serves solely currently for um, young girls of color. Excommunicate, that's kind of extreme. Um, wait, 
disown. There you go. What levels of? <laughs> um, yeah, her family wanted to disown her because she didn't want to marry. Um, and she was very passionate about teaching. She would like go behind the um, parishioners' like demands, like, "Oh, you can't teach these slaves here," you know. But she she dedicated her life to that. Um, and she's also named after one of the major streets here. If you get the time, Angela Bassett actually uh, stars in a movie portraying Marie Henriette. So take that time. It's on YouTube too. It was a weird movie I just came across, but it's awesome. I'm gonna get tired of these pistols. Um, speaking of cathedrals, uh, the most historic that definitely pertains to Treme is St. Augustine Catholic Church. Um, this church is definitely still standing and the walking up to it, you feel the, the history um, in it. Uh, the, the few pictures that I put here, the drawings and the paintings are, they're still how you see it then. And this lower picture there is exactly how it stands. Um, St. Augustine Catholic Church of New Orleans was the first black church in Louisiana and the first black Catholic church um, in the United States. In the 1830s, a group of free African-American New Orleanians, yes, it's on Rampart. With it, and you know, you just like go past it and you don't, I, I, like you just like miss it, but it is monumentous, like it's huge. Um, well, the Catholic Church in the United States, and in the 1830s, a group of free African-Americans, New Orleanians became, began, sorry, organizing to create a Catholic church in Trinidad, St. Augustine, uh, with the blessings of Antoine Blanc, God rest his soul, I'm Catholic too, so, uh, the first Archbishop of New Orleans. The parish was founded in 1841, and the first ceremony was held there on October 9th, 1842. So this is a very uh, dated church, and this is definitely like, uh, uh, like it's, it's, it's a sign that Treme was established as its own sector, separate from New Orleans, even before it became incorporated. Um, civil rights activist Homer Plessy, gangster, okay, and uh, A.P. Turod were parishioners of St. Augustine, and were jazz musician uh, Sidney Bechet and Mardi Gras Indian chief Tootie Montana. Uh, what they do do to keep it, uh, they actually hold a yearly festival for Sachmo, which is another um, renowned uh, musician coming from the Treme as well. Um, the fact that they can hold a whole ceremony like that for them is also great too. So they're still very well uh, integrated in the community. Uh, the church did not take considerable damage after Hurricane Katrina, but had been put on probation due to financing and lack of attendance. Uh, in March, 2009, the <laughs> Archdiocese took St. Augustine off probation. Uh, today, St. Augustine Catholic Church of New Orleans continues to hold church services and sponsor. <laughs> that is very true. There is also a lot of good names. And touching on that, I, I wanted to put it, but like, I, I didn't want to really offend anybody. Uh, the church, although yes, it's great. It was the first um, black Catholic church um, in the United States. This church also held grounds to a lot of um, slaves that were killed. And when I say killed, they were killed abruptly. And when they had to make rid of their bodies hastily, they would bury them on these grounds. So the grounds of St. Augustine actually are the grounds of a lot of slaves and unmarked slaves as well. Like they, it's kind of, it hits hard. Like again, when you walk past this place, you feel it. Um, and there is a huge monument of a cross with chains on it that basically uh, commemorates the unmarked graves of these slaves. Um, and it was one of the first places I've seen that me being Black and Filipino and touching, getting in touch with my black side this was something that was just mind opening to me how they can yeah definitely and, um, and i love how they can make their vow to black history so very public you know because that's what you need to experience 
Um, without crying, I have a petty story. So <laughs> with this being the, um, the first black church, <laughs> well, yeah, there were, there were a lot of, um, it was basically like when you wanted to get rid of a dead body, you, you, you bring them. And most of the dead bodies, especially around this time, lynching was happening very rapidly um, for no means. And so to get rid of the body, they buried them on the grounds of St. Augustine Church. Um, yeah, it, it, I know it's, it's, it's very bone chilling, actually. Um, well, that was my petty story, my petty story. So with it, <laughs> with it being a very successful black uh, parishioning church, um, of course, there were um, white members of the community that were outraged that there was going to be a Catholic church uh, focused and aiming towards the black community. So what they decided to do was campaign to uh, purchase all of the pews. If no one is familiar with a pew, it's basically that very uncomfortable chair that you sit on in church. Um, they campaigned to purchase all of them, but they were actually outnumbered by the amount of black and free black people um, to do that. So they kind of failed on their part, I'm talking about petty. But yeah, I thought it was funny. Good joke. Moving on. All right, pause. Wait, should I see myself in this? Yes. All right, I've got to go grab my chilled glass. Um, this also is, um, I'm going to do my rendition of it. Wood star brandy, but we're going to definitely put some whiskey in there. I'll be right back. This is awesome. I'm loving every second of this. Thank you for sharing all the things and all the facts. Um, yeah, it's decided to talk Sazerac. I think this I, is- uh, Very I first trip to uh, New Orleans. I went to Sazerac bar and it was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. Yeah, and the Sazerac bar, like, it's definitely like the aesthetic for me too. It just, like that's the place you go for a Sazerac. I felt fancy as fuck. I was like, look at me with the Sazerac in my hand. <laughs> I've like, I've had it in a plastic cup too and I felt fancy. It's, it's not the vessel, it's the contents, right? I'm firing my assistant today. All right, so the Sazerac. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite cocktails to talk about just because every component of it has a history that is tied to uh, the city of New Orleans. And a lot of those ties are actually uh, responsible from African-Americans, or sorry, Africans, Natives. Um, so the Sazerac originally started off as a brandy cocktail. Um, it was named, the brandy itself was a Sazerac de Forge. It feels, forgive me guys, I'm, I speak to Bob, I don't speak French. Uh, brand of cognac brandy that served as its original main ingredient uh, with bitters being made of a local apothecary from Antoine Amity Um, So originally the cocktail would have the absinthe prints, but with the band of absinthe, uh, they procured, huh? Oh, probably cognac everything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with the band of absinthe, um, they decided to make a very distinct New Orleans um, anise, which like everywhere else you can find it, you know, after the band of absinthe, you can have an anise rinse in it, but very particular and distinct to New Orleans, we use herb sand here. Um, this is actually one of my favorite labels for the bottle. With the herb sand rinse, oh, we, I like to just put just a dash. Swirl it just around a little bit. I don't have a shot glass to put in it because I'm definitely not going to drink this later. But I'm done. Okay. All right. Chilled glass. Um, 
preferably. Um, in most places, you will find that your Sazerac will be served in a chilled glass um, with the absinthe rinse. Uh, what is Ogen? I'm sorry. There are a few questions in the chat. Sorry, you might yeah. have missed. Came Either. back. To chat. Um, somebody said, anybody ever use Ogen instead of Herb Saint? And then another question was, why do you think, what do you think is the major difference between herb saint and absinthe? Um, so, oh, hen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, hen. Ah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, I was just about to say, um, personally, I find a distinct difference between a French pastis to this. Um, I feel this kind of has more of a like wraparound mouth feel. Um, it's more on the, how can I say this? Like candy side. It, it, it goes very well with the, with the simple syrup and the spice of, I can't believe I'm gonna read so fast. Um, I like this preferably. Like I said, it, 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 for me, it completes the cocktail. Um, pastis is a little too, like I said, personally, um, obscuring to the cocktail. It can, it can overpower. It sometimes, and I mean, nobody drinks chilled herb sink, but you'll definitely drink a chilled pastis, you know? Like you, you order pastis for itself, but the herb sink definitely helps complement every component of the simple cocktail, personally speaking. Um, this is also another uh, stirred cocktail. that we're once again going to use Knob Creek. Try not to break my iPad too. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll do two parts of uh, rye whiskey and normally in New Orleans, uh, despite our wonderful sponsors, we will use Sazerac rye um, that has a, a large history. And again, this is a very, it is a New Orleans cocktail, so every component to it is straight up New Orleans. Um, we serve two ounces with it, and the Peshaw's bitters, we mentioned the apothecary. Uh, he actually used this originally to aid um, everybody's like tummy aches, so he used this for medicinal purposes, but later on incorporated it into like brandy cocktails, hence like the Sazerac. Um, if I were to be making it in a bar and really it's a very subtle taste. Um, it's definitely like a, a personal taste kind of gauge. I always add uh, four parts, four dashes of Peshaz along with two dashes Ango. Now the simple syrup, I use a two to one and why I like using a two to one, if nobody knows what that is, it's a two part sugar, one part water is because again, just like what the herb saint does, it really rounds out the flavors and makes it very velvety. Um, do a bar spoon of it. Cocktail. And what's crazy is like, this is like, just like an old fashioned, you might get somebody that wants more bitters in it. Have at it. Um, strain, not on the rocks either. Meet into the glass. This also gets a, I don't know. It's, it, my dexterity is kind of weird, so this is a, a goal for me. So lemon rind. Also, if you ever use fruit garnishes, please, if you care about the people you're serving cocktails to, rinse your fruit. Just lemon rind. Again, expression over Sazerac cocktail. 
if you ever come to New Orleans, that is definitely something that you've got to have and nobody's going to judge you for it. Can I sit this one too? Still not messing things up. Oh yeah, I'm doing good. Sweet. This is, I haven't done this since college. This is awesome. Um, okay. So present day New Orleans, uh, present day Treme. Uh, Treme has been through a lot of loss of culture and trying to regain and preserve. Uh, the pictures that you see to the right are not only like the landmarks that you'll see once visiting the Treme, um, but they still stand very strong. And again, this is one of the only places I've ever lived where you are literally like you're in a twilight zone. You're going back in time. Um, and you feel good about it. You don't feel uncomfortable. Uh, oh, hey, there's that cross I mentioned. Um, it, it, it's a place that will forever let you know where you are. Uh, present day Chime is still, it is a professional part of New Orleans. Um, currently with the housing rising and the houses that I mentioned earlier, those houses are, they would range from 500,000 to 700,000 now over a million dollars per property. Um, the Treme is still being very flushed out with gentrification. And I mean, with even that being said, you still have a neighbor, neighborly aspect to it. Um, with the Treme coffee house, there's back of town coffee house. Everybody will come together and make sure that that part of New Orleans is still preserved. Um, it is one of the safest parts to actually walk around as well. Um, and it is, I'm sorry, I don't wanna cry about it. Um, it is one of the places that present day, I wish everybody can see first. Um, it, to me, it's, it is the definition of New Orleans. It is the first place you should see when you come to New Orleans because um, you'll have a better and general understanding of their contribution to what you really love about New Orleans. Um, places like Armstrong Park is still standing very strong. I mentioned earlier Mahalia Jackson Theater. Um, Carver Theater also was one of the first theaters within the business district too. Um, and present day Treme, again, is one of the most vibrant parts of the city. Um, and it still holds very true to what it started out as. All right, this was actually one of my favorites. This is from one of my idols. Um, Abigail Gala, I had the very great, uh, had a great opportunity meeting her uh, during my first season of Speed Rack. I will never drink for Nat ever again thanks to that night, but um, her cocktail, <laughs> her cocktail step by, I learned very well that first night, um, her cocktail step by step is a great way to basically define the, <laughs> the progressional, um, basically ladder that the Treme is working on with the activism and staying true to making sure everybody's aware that like, this is not what you think it is. You're coming to New Orleans. This is New Orleans. Um, and this is also one of the uh, reasons why Treme is its own place with having segregated schools. We're all familiar um, with this lady, Ruby. Uh, she made this cocktail based off her. Uh, the golden age uh, in Louisiana did not last very long. So I mentioned earlier, yeah, it was. it's like a wonderland for free people of color, uh, but a, a Unfortunately, after the Louisiana Purchase, uh, things started to decline and the introduction of white Americans basically kind of like interrupted the progression of it. Um, and it, I mean, it, it sucks. Like even this particular woman going to school, uh, acing above, what is it? Eight out of 10, I'm sorry, six out of 10 people that got tested. She, high, she scored the highest having threats um, to go to the school. And this school that she went to is actually a school in the Treme, the, uh, next to the levee. Um, 
With the ending of the uh, reconstruction in 1877, federal troops withdrew from the South, of course. Uh, the White League, a white supremacist organization in Louisiana, swept through and resegregated schools. Uh, segregation then returned to New Orleans after 10 years of being this wonderland of like, you know, I can actually feel free. Um, and I, I quote this from the, the book, I have it myself. Um, the step-by-step -step made by Egan Irish, well, we're not using Egan's today, we're actually using, woo, Kilberts, thank you, Dean. Uh, the white, it was um, called the White League, uh, was a white supremacist organization in Louisiana amongst many. And to my knowledge, even during this time uh, of the reconstruction, uh, you had lawmakers where they said, no, they were definitely not subtle. Um, they made it very known that they will not accept segregation at all. Not only did they, of course, you know, influence people in New Orleans, but there were motions in Baton Rouge to um, Natchitoches. Uh, and this is a time where Black people were able to have positions as like lawmakers. Um, they had very reputable positions. You know, you had philanthropists, you had philosophers, you had apothecaries. You had physicians, and of course, it was not to their liking once this had happened. So they were not subtle at all. Um, they made it very known, and I believe this was like in with New Orleans being the the free world for free people of color. Um, it was an uptick on lynchings and deaths of people. It's never subtle. You're absolutely right. They're absorbed into state. I need to see these things. Can I see? Can I do that? No, I'll come back to the comments later. I love you, Katie. Yes. Okay. Um, so again, this is this cocktail was made by one of my idols amongst many that are actually in this room. Um, the step by step made by Biggins. Irish whiskey was created by Dame Abigail Gallo. Heads off. Head bartender at Capella Le Pen at the time um, in New Orleans. Uh, Ruby Nail Bridges Hall, which was the, again, first African-American student to desegregate public schools in Louisiana in 1960. Um, and this cocktail was named for the Ruby Bridges Suite, uh, a spoken word musical and choir piece inspired by Ruby's courageous steps. Um, and this cocktail it, like I said, kind of encompasses the way that the Treme is continuously, they're not breaking away from making things better. Um, and I thought we'd start off with it. I do apologize. I did not put the um, specs in the actual slide here, but I will put them in the comments later. Um, but this is also a shaking cocktail and I have to, my assistant's fired. Okay. I'm gonna be back again with my chilled glass. BRB. I actually thought you said I was fired for a second. I was like, no, don't fire me. <laughs> um, yeah, we will have Ella Louise also update this slide so that it reflects it later on when we post it on the website. Okay. So um, the cocktail itself does call for an Irish whiskey. So I did want to stay to true to her specs. Um, the only difference in within this is um, there is a ginger liqueur. Um, I thought without uh, messing her cocktail specs up too much, I made a ginger syrup instead um, because after tasting the cocktail, I really do believe having that kick um, and heat from the ginger really balance everything out. Again, um, you could use a ginger liqueur or you can simply make a ginger syrup. Um, if you'd like my specs on my ginger syrup, I will definitely put those in the comments for you. Uh, so this is a shaking cocktail and I feel like I haven't shaken a cocktail in so long. Um, served up, chilled poop glass, so close. Um, you're gonna do one and a half parts Irish whiskey. Um, if you, again, there is ginger in this cocktail. So if you want to, this is really great actually with it being the single grain, um, it works very smoothly and does not um, 
make it in a braised cocktail having the ginger syrup. Um, I've also tried it with Klontar. It is unfortunately not under the beam centauri thing, but if you want something a little more on the mellow side, you can use like a Powers and Klontar or something that really complements the ginger component of the cocktail. Uh, definitely kill that in. Um, we're gonna do one and a half parts. And we're gonna use a dry vermouth as well. And this is gonna be one part dry vermouth. And when I say one part, one ounce is. Um, if you have a preference in your dry vermouth, a Spanish one is definitely the way to go. Again, like every part of it, of this cocktail, pretty much balances itself out. Uh, La Stiles is definitely a great one to use as well. Uh, we're also gonna do the one and a half of ginger syrup. I'm sorry, that's a lot of syrup. Half an ounce of ginger syrup. Um, and the ginger syrup, I also use a two to one. That kind of is like my go-to. I just really like the velvetiness that comes from having a very, one ounce driving with Spanish. Oh, thank you very much, Lauren. On it. Um, along with that, we're gonna do um, three quarters lemon juice. I always like using fresh lemon juice. Forgive me for my shot glass, but it's the only vessel I have. Along with a um, half an ounce of cane syrup. Um, I personally love using local cane. Uh, Louisiana is great for that. And again, my specs, especially for a darker syrup, will always be a, a, a two to one. Um, again, because I, I like that mouthfeel. Don't take that the wrong way. All right, this also is a cocktail that calls for a absinthe rinse. And since we're seeing very uh, New Orleans, we're going to use an herb safe rinse. Does anybody ever give somebody like the shot, like when you chill the glass and like, like do you want this? It's like wasted alcohol, like just take it. People are apprehensive about it, but I always, Give it to them. All right, the syringe. Right? Alcohol abuse. No, I rarely use that term too, but that's clearly what that is. Again, this is a shaken cocktail. And um, if you don't have a shaker, you can do like what New Orleans. Um... Yes, absolutely. I really just, you know, Anise is like a really, um, have it like come like you have to be acquainted with it kind of thing it's like my lord like you actually gotta really convince yourself that you love it then you love it we'll not talk about my lord white absinthe huh. can you put that on there i'd like to get some white absinthe for the house and put it in my husband's coffee that'd be nice Shaking cocktail. Personally, with all shaking cocktails, I really like to double strain. Um, if you don't have a double strainer and you like those ice chips, go for it. Again, ain't nobody judging you. So where the hell is my strainer? Huzzah, there it is. All right, uh, this, I, okay, this is gonna be my finishing cocktail. You must have amazing noise cancellation. I live in a condo, so it <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure they don't hear this, but they'll hear everything else. Um, this particular uh, cocktail does, does get a uh, thyme garnish and the significance of thyme um, coming from Abigail is a, a symbol of perseverance. I know, right? I don't even have high ceilings, it's crazy. Um, the symbol of thyme is perseverance and moving forward and having optimism. 
in whatever you do, hence the step-by-step -step cocktail. Slap, slap, top it off. And here you go, the step-by-step -by, -step by Abigail Bala. That looks amazing. Oh man, I really wish there was technology available for you to just pass that through the screen. I'm like, <laughs> actually my mouth is like actually watering and I'm like, do I have absinthe? Do I have? <laughs> I'm like looking at the product. I'm like, man, I'm going to have a good week. <laughs> I have a question about your ginger syrup. So the traditional specs that you did, did you, um, because obviously traditionally it's ginger liqueur and you did a syrup, did you have to adjust that all? Um, I did actually. So what I'm familiar with with ginger liqueurs, um, and I'm, I'm on, granted, I don't know all of them, but the ones that I'm very familiar with, um, they tend to be a little bit more on the syrupy side. So there wasn't a particular ginger liqueur that was noted in the specs. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that I stick, like if you're gonna add ginger to a cocktail, there's a reason why. Um, so when I take ginger, I know what ginger is. It's heat, it's like, it adds that bite to it. And some ginger liqueurs don't do that. Uh, so what I did do, um, and this is, this is my method and I, I normally steep it. I steep it and I kind of pulse it just to keep a little bit of that in there and double strain it and keep the syrup of it. Thanks, awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's, everybody has their um, recipes for syrups. For me, I don't like sweet stuff, but I'm definitely a two for one. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm there with you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, if anyone has questions for Eloise, please put them in the chat. We want to get those questions answered for you. Uh, thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, but this was great. Man, I, I, I definitely learned a lot. These classes have been really, really amazing. Oh, um, well, I saw that. Okay. So many really neurons and this is helping. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, definitely. Um, Again, I've never visited New Orleans after like my dad showing me just, you know, just a glimpse of it. And moving from Chicago, it was a whole different world and actually a very comfortable one for me. Um, fair warning, if you do look up housing and it says NOLA charm, just know you're not gonna get any privacy. <laughs> you, can, you can scream at your neighbors from across your window. Um, that's NOLA charm for you basically. But it's, it's definitely a place that you can come and be transparent. And if you really immerse yourself in it, you can take so much from it. How do we follow you? There's a lot of questions. Okay. Um, well, I am on Instagram. Uh, I am on Instagram as Dine-In Special. I'm currently working with somebody to help me market my uh, pairing my pairings with my food and my cocktails. So bear with me right now, you're just gonna see workout videos and clouds. Um, I'm also on Facebook as Ella Louise Bailey. Uh, if you ever just wanna say hi, I generally respond within 30 minutes and that kind of person. Um, and if you have any questions upon any visits that you take down here, I'd be more than happy to navigate or answer any questions that you may have. Um, and my favorite bar in New Orleans, I love cane and table. I cannot lie. Okay, there's like different spectrums. Cane and table is one of my favorite bars solely because it was the first bar that I went to in the quarter that I was abandoned at actually, but had a really great daiquiri at. Um, and one of my other bars to that is um, Sydney Saloon, just with it being the first bar that I actually got to experience while I was here. Yeah, there's my Instagram. Um, New Orleans has influenced my food pop-up in so many ways. Um, I'm, I'm Black and Filipino, and I grew up uh, with my Filipino side more. Um, so New Orleans and being very, how can I, like, not stupidly naive, but just very embracing of something that I'm not familiar with has helped me actually um, get in touch more with that side. Um, it's answered a lot of questions for me as far as like, where do I really fit in? Um, this is something I've never experienced before. And it's actually 
humbled me and made me appreciate so much of like what my dad would have wanted for me to learn. And I'm really glad that New Orleans has helped me learn that on my own. And the food pop-up, my food pop-up is, is Filipino food with just a splash of little, little melanin all in it, you know. Yeah, and the Sanchos, definitely love the Sanchos. You know what's crazy? I'm actually in a confliction with bartending and cooking. Um, I love bartending. And what I love about bartending is the educational aspect of it, um, especially that as somebody that I went to school for uh, world history and secondary education, um, I never would have thought that I'd be a bartender. And being a bartender has helped me in all other facets learn and interpret so many different things on my own, in my own pace. Um, but I definitely love cooking. I am a snob about aesthetic. I worked at the aviary for Christ's sakes. I'm all about the very details of stuff. And I really love that. I can put so much mint in a cocktail, but I really love that I can definitely detail a plate as if it's a work of art. Yes, I definitely love these delicious <laughs> But yeah, um, cooking has definitely become a passion of mine. And I think they go really hand in hand. And it's, it's been a great experience uh, in between both of them. Adrienne is also one of my inspirations too. She's one of the only people, well, not one of the only people, but one of the people that I can talk to, just throw ideas at and really talk about those things. And that's what I love about doing both really. I'm going to take a sip of this now. Sorry, sometimes my phone just doesn't want to work when I need it to. So finding the unmute button can be difficult. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, this is good. Yeah, no, you do great. She's very talented, and um, I'm really happy that you have her as uh, someone you can look up to in that work. Uh, she's like my big sis, man. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be a part of this at all, actually. If she didn't help me, uh, I said, believe in myself. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't have known people like Lynette and Ivy um, and everything like that. So she's definitely an influential pinnacle in all of this for me. So is she still in my big dummy? <laughs> yeah, she's pretty wonderful. She's very talented. Um, I'm happy that we uh, got to spend some time together working together for a brief uh, moment. So uh, awesome. this is awesome, dude. I learned so much. It's quite fascinating how much you realize you don't know when you have moments to really you know uh engage in conversation and see these presentations and all of all of you folks who um who did these presentations for uh speed rock academy really killed it so thank you for taking the time to you know lean into this research and share these stories uh they're, you're obviously very passionate about what it is that you do so uh we appreciate it very much absolutely i i god it was so much fun for me too yeah, that's awesome. Um, so if you're watching this later on, thank you for watching. Um, if you want to share this lovely video with your friends, uh, it will be uploaded to YouTube in about 20 minutes or so. Uh, so you can just look up uh, FO Health um, for referencing this later. We will get that slide uh, updated with the last cocktail. And these uh, the presentation will be uploaded to our website as well if you'd like to reference it later on. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you joining us. and. Um, Oh. I hope oh, I think I lost it there for a second. Um, wait, oh, wait, I'm back. There you go. <laughs> Appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure I'll see you soon. Sure thing. Thank you guys so much. Oh. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Cheers. 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 Oh, that was cool. All right. I'm hanging up now. Whoop.